I'm David Coward. For those who don't know who I am, I was, um, I started at Slack in 1963. I was um, Dick Taylor's deputy group leader of the Slack Group A during the time all of this uh, stuff that we're talking about was being done. Um, I wanted to make one comment apropos of what Marty said about the lifestyle in 1964, 65. Uh, when I got to Slack, they were building the, I should say I was went to Slack, got my PhD there, and I was Panofsky's next to last graduate student. And um, when I came up to Slack from Stanford, they had just started building the accelerator and accelerator housing. And there were four of us <coughs> who were in charge of uh, the business end of the accelerator. Dick Taylor was in charge of the switchyard. I was given responsibility for the end station areas. Um, Hobie Destabler took advantage of, uh, did all of the radiation safety calculations. And um, Ed Garwin was responsible for how do you design things like collimators and beam dumps and that sort of stuff. And uh, the, uh, for the other three guys were all in their very early 30s. I was 28. No review committees. We talked to Peef from time to time about what we were doing. And he was so smart that in one microsecond, he knew what was going on. And uh, you look at today's date with review committees ad nauseum. You finish one review committee, and you start preparing for the next one. Anyway. For good fun, um, first speaker this afternoon is my dear colleague, Ari Bodek, from the University of Washington. Yeah. Hmm? Rochester. Rochester, I'm sorry, Washington, what am I say? <laughs> Rochester, he's the George H. Uh, George Paik Professor of Physics there. Uh, I knew him when he came out to Slack to start work with us on the deep inelastic stuff. And uh, uh, oh, he also won the uh, Panofsky Award in 2004. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So uh, have at it, sir. OK, thank you. So thank you. Uh, when I came to Slack, uh, there are two people who influenced me. I mean, Mary Breimer taught me in microrhythm everything we, you are supposed to know. And Dave Coward uh, said, all right, uh, you have some, I have some work for you to do. And he took me to some warehouse, and there were a whole bunch of photo tubes and counters. And he says, these photo tubes are bad. You have to replace them with good photo tubes. So there's a razor blade, and you bang it, and you take the photo tube off. And then you make some epoxy, and you stick the photo tube on. So that was my first introduction to experimental physics, yeah, real experimental physics, <laughs> was from Dave Coward. So I will talk about uh, uh, the evidence for factual charges of, core, of partons. And people talked about about the, how accepted or not accepted the quark model was at Slack. Uh, when I was there uh, and I met uh, Gilman, Fred Gilman, who was a theorist there, and he taught me all about the quark model. And then he said, what I do is I calculate everything in the privacy of my own office using the quark model. And then I translate everything to some field theoretical or some other kind of, and then I publish that one. I never say anything about the quarks, so it was always done in secret. So people believed in quarks, but they kept it a secret. <laughs> All right. So uh, first I'll just say something by myself. I started working for Jerry Freeman and Henry Campbell as an undergraduate in 67. And in 67, I, I worked with John Litt on analysis of very uh, preliminary data that was studying electron neuron quasi basic scattering. And this is when I started working on Deuteron. And then I was an MIT undergraduate. I, I wrote a senior thesis on uh, Fermi motion extract extraction of neutron cross section from deuterium data. And that sort of led to my thesis, my thesis experiment, uh, which is a comparison of neutron and proton the structure function. And then I went on to Caltech as a medical fellow and started working on the neutrino experiment which then provided more evidence for the fractional charge quarks, which I will discuss. And now I'm at Rochester. So, so 
Although we had to do it in secret, this is what we did. <laughs> we calculated, we showed that the ratio of the neutron to proton uh, structure function. Uh, and there's a, we assumed there was a quark anti quark C, so the ratio of neutron to proton structure function will be about one because the C dominates. But then as you get to higher values of X, the valence quark, uh, three quarks that mix the valence quark are, if, you, if they're the same distribution, you'll get two thirds, but there's a limit of a quarter when one quark, like D quark, dominates in the, neutro, in the proton and U quark dominates in the neutron called by isospin symmetry. So there was a limit which is a quarter. So there were many different theories at the time they tried to explain scaling. And some of them did not believe in quark. They were, they believed in multi, multi resonances, lots and lots of resonances making up the deep elastic scattering. And then there were uh, integer quarks because nobody believed in uh, integer partons. Nobody believed, and a lot of people didn't believe in, in fractional charges. So, so they came up with a resonance model with lots of resonances. And uh, there were two papers in uh, 1970 here that uh, these resonance models, which have no partons, uh, have a ratio of about two thirds. And another paper on resonance model a year later say, said between 0.0 to 0.78. So, we, so these non-partonic models had definite prediction for the ratio of neutron to proton structure functions. And then, uh, T.D. Lee and Dwell uh, uh, said, well, what if there were partons, but well, there must be bare nucleons and bare pions. So they came up with, with uh, this, this model. Uh, and the, in their model, which is a bare nucleon and proton, integer size quarks, you're going to get uh, the ratio of neutron to proton structure functions to be going to zero. OK, so, so this is a generation after the experiment that uh, Mario talked about, uh, I was uh, doing hydrogen and deuterium comparison and the experiment, my thesis experiment was 49B and then I was uh, at uh, do it, did experiment E87 as a postdoc and me, uh, I focused on the ratio of neutron to protons and Michael Ridden will talk next, who was uh, talking, uh, will uh, talk about the quark spin. So, as Maori showed, uh, there, was, uh, the the, the, there were targets, the, the new targets, in, in order to maintain the, the density of the liquid hydrogen and liquid deuterium, were, were circulating targets with a the, with the fan. And at the time, uh, I, thought, I thought we only had three weeks for that particular experiment. Uh, uh, and we had two of those. We had deuterium and hydrogen circulating cells. Uh, okay, now within a day, we found out that the circulation fan of the deuterium target was not working, and the beam heated up the target, which we called target boiling, and the density was affected by the intensity of the electron beam. And I think it was Mari, Mari's idea to come back with the 1.6, to monitor the density using the 1.6 GeV spectrometer, which in his talk he said didn't do very much, but actually it did a lot. It measured, kept, they measured the density of our to change target. So you set up the 1.6 GV spectrometer to detect recall protons from quasi-elastic scattering from the deuterium, and that and so even if the target density changed, the, the, the counting rate in the 1.6 GV spectrometer would fluctuate up and down, and it will be used as a density monitor. So that saved the day. So. So these are the experiments that uh, Mari talked about, and the hydrogen and the deuterium experiment was 16, 18, and 20, and 20, 34 degrees, and then later on, there was more, more, more angles. Uh, so this, is, this, this was the first experiment to look at deep inelastic scattering from hydrogen and deuterium. Uh, so the experiment was very difficult uh, once you get the target density correctly, uh, but you had to worry about the Fermi motion so the, the and unsmearing and getting the free neutron cross section. So that was the important thing that you had to do to understand, to get neutrons from deuterium data. So when we measured the, the 
W2 structure function in, 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 in proton, neutron, and deuterium by subtraction. They basically exhibited similar scaling behavior. The scatter you see here are the scaling violations that Mar Michael Reardon will, will discuss. Anyway, I wanted to just mention that, that Jerry and MIT's lab collaboration got the credit for the quark discovery, but they did not, but should have also gotten the credit for the discovery of the gluons, as was discussed before. The integral of F2 of X did not add up to one, and the missing momentum was attributed to the gluon, just like Pauli's missing energy in beta decay was attributed to neutrinos. So I would think that gluons were discovered in 1970, way before Petra. So, but that's actually not mentioned very much because supposedly uh, you have to have actually see the gluon jet in Petra to believe there were gluons. Uh, so, the, and there were scaling violations that, that uh, were discovered in 1970 to 1973 that Michael Rudin will talk about. And so, the, the Fermi motion calculations, I did my undergraduate thesis on uh, Fermi motion calculations in deuterium. And then Atwood and West uh, wrote a, a paper on the, also on Fermi motion correction to, uh, to the term. Uh, and then I, I, I modified them to, there were, there were some issues with the calculation and I wrote a comment that, that corrected some of, the, uh, some of the things they said to make it better, that's all right. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, so this is the data and I'm gonna, show you data from the E49B, which is my PhD thesis, and it's in, in open triangles. And this is a six and 10 degrees. And I'll show you data from an experiment later, uh, E87, that uh, 15, 19, 20, 16, 34, you see much more precise. So if you compare to the non-protonic model, such as resonance model, it was obviously that they didn't work, they didn't work. So this particular measurement ruled these non-protonic models out. And what about the protonic model from each of our squawk? This is the, the prediction from the, from the TDD and DREL model, uh, paper of 1972, uh, and the data sort of satisfied the lower bound of the quark model, which will be a quarter. Okay, so I think there was evidence for the for quarks. The ratio of neutron to proton was evidence for quark, but uh, based on the E49B data, which had some larger statistical error. So we went back and did more precise the uh, measurement, which we published uh, in physics letters in 1974, uh, which showed that the quark model lower bound of 0.25 was valid and, and that implies that, the D, that at a very large x, only the D quark from the neutron and U quark from the proton contribute. Now, you might wonder why uh, this paper was published in physical review letters and this paper a year later was published in physics letters, which is a European journal, an American journal. So, it was published in physics letters because it was rejected by physical review letters. Uh, we said that this report uh, uh, is uh, not very novel and stimulating, as to what, and it's too short. And then it said that the first article pretty much did everything, and therefore there's nothing new to say. So the new, the, although more precision really nailed it down, it wasn't sufficiently good for this particular referees. And in, that, in addition, uh, there, was be, there would be in the future much better data from, the, from Fermilab uh, that's upcoming. And since that data will be a lot more interesting, this data shouldn't be published. So, so the definitive confirmation of fractional quark charges was published in physics data. Uh, and the story uh, on the, public, on the observation, observation of scaling violation was also the same, it was also rejected because they said, well, first they discovered scaling, then they discovered scaling violations, what are the guys got, what are, what's going on? <laughs> so, uh, 
I just want to diverse about the, the, the show diversion. Uh, in 1983, uh, there, there was a lot of interest in the scattering cross-section from nuclear targets, uh, because they found out that the scattering from nuclear targets may not have been described just by Fermi motion. So I went back to SLAC, uh, and I think to the same warehouse that I did the photo tubes. There was a big box there, and everything was there. Everything was, was recorded. Uh, all my logbooks were there. The even pieces of the, tar of the target wall were there. You can remeasure them. Everything was there. And we reanalyzed the data. We analyzed the empty target data to get the ratio of iron to the deuterium cross sections. And we sent it to physics letters, physical review letters. Uh, but since it talked about nuclear targets, it went to the nuclear physics referees, OK? And, and nuclear, one referee says, there are no quarks in nuclei. Well, or the title of the, of the paper was Quarks in Nuclei. And the first referee says, what are you talking about? There's no quarks in nuclei. So this is a nuclear physicist who, in 1983, still hasn't heard about quarks. <laughs> and then the second referee said, you need to calculate the multiple scattering of the electrons in the nucleus before it hits a quark and prove that the effect you're seeing is not from multiple scattering, which, of course, violates everything they have to do with one photon exchange. And, you know, so the paper was rejected. And, uh, but at the time, I was already a faculty member, and I knew that one, should, one of the things you have to do as a faculty member is to fight with referees. This is a requirement. And so <laughs> this time, we didn't fight with referees, but that time, I thought it was so ridiculous. So I, I called the Schwitters, who was the editor of Physical Review Letters, and I said, what's going on? And, and Schwitters says, OK, the first referee about quarks, yeah, I agree. You know, there are quarks in nuclear. The second referee, though, may be right. Could you calculate the multiple scattering in the nucleus? And I said, are you crazy? Don't you know about one photon exchange? And anyway, so then the paper was accepted. So that's just a sideline. About, uh, about the fact that this paper uh, was published in physics letters. OK. So there was an, the electron scattering from neutrons and protons. The, then, uh, the, as Chris Lawrence Smith mentioned, that uh, if you compare neutrino scattering to electron scattering, uh, you get the, this 3.6, 1850, it was called the 1850 rule. And it doesn't matter very much on X because uh, if, you, if you add neutrons and protons together, you have an isoscalar target, which uh, most of the neutrino targets, all the neutrino targets were actually not on hydrogen and deuterium. Most of the experiments were on heavy liquids or iron. Uh, then uh, it doesn't very much depend on X because they have an equal number of d quark and u quark. So the, the first experiment that uh, uh, was a uh, Gargamel, Gargamel heavy liquid freon experiment. Uh, and this is a picture of it at the time, that is from February 1977. And then this is a picture of Gargamel now, sitting out in front of a building and not taking any data. So, <laughs> but these are some pictures of what the data looked like. And they published this paper in 1975, where because of very, very low energy, they used another scale, scaling variable, x prime. Uh, and also, they had a lot of uh, quasi-elastic uh, events, in the, and they sort of added the quasi-elastic and the inelastic. And lo and behold, uh, the 18th fifth rule, this is the 18th fifth rule uh, curve from Slack, and it's fed right on. So you could say that this was a verification of the, of the quark model because the 18th rule was confirmed. However, it was very, very low Q square and low energies and used this other scaling variable x prime. So although it was confirmation, it wasn't definitive. So then uh, at 1974, I, I came to, to Fermilab 
And this is the Caltech neutrino experiment, Caltech frame of neutrino experiment, the stacks of iron, and then in, uh, scintillation counters, and spark chambers, and a magnetized iron detector. And in Fermilab in those days, you, you, you really try to do things very cheaply. So this, this, this floor was a dirt floor, and if you wanted to do a, make a cable tray, you just dug it. I mean, that was pretty, that's the way you did it. So, <laughs> so this is the Caltech uh, Fermilab neutrino experiment that, was, that went on to higher energy. So if you can compare the energy of uh, Gargamel, which is about one to two GeV, and then compare the, what I call the dichromatic beam at, uh, for, for 190 GeV setting. At Fermilab, you had the peak, a K on decay peak of about 150, and a pi on decay beam peak of around 40. And in 1978, uh, this experiment also confirmed the 518th rule. Definitely with very high Q square, so there's no, no questions about it. So, by the end of 75, uh, the ratio of the neutron to proton structure function in electron scattering uh, showed that uh, it was consistent with the quark model. And then the ratio of neutron and electron scattering on nuclei at low energy in 1975 and high energy in 1978 also provided evidence that protons are fractionally charged quarks. So uh, at that time, I think uh, a lot of people believed in quark in 1975, except for the referee in 1983 who reviewed my nuclear physics paper. <laughs> so I think that uh, what happened to the clock? I, I finished early? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Five minutes more to go. Well, you can ask questions. <laughs> I thought it was 25 minutes, but five minutes for questions. So instead of 30 right. minutes, I, I, it's Ari, 25. Ari, you're the first person I know that's given a lecture that's finished early. <laughs> well, you, it's because I thought it was 25 minutes long instead ah. of 30. <laughs> Do we have any question? Yes, yeah, there's a question from Dr. Reardon. Yeah. On the scaling violations, I'd like to make the additional point. I think we have to be fair that we couldn't really make distinguish whether we were seeing the approach to scaling or scaling violations per se. I think with the, with the benefit of history, which I know a little bit about, I think we can look back and say, yes, we were seeing scaling violations. But at the time, I don't think we could convince, at least not the referees, that we were seeing scaling violations. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I mean, I don't know if we did it versus the target mass variable C, which accounted for those. Did, but uh, there was still deviation from C, which for QCD. Any more questions? Going once, going twice. Thank you. Dr. Bodek, thank you very much. OK. The last of my good collaborators, Michael Reardon, whom we've known since um, 1966, I guess, something like that. Michael came out from MIT. At that time, he was known by Ed. And so you will hear me every once in a while slip back in the, to the old days. Uh, Michael did his PhD thesis for MIT, but he was at Slack for a number of years. Um, he then went into history, uh, history of science and uh, published a great book called The Hunting of the Quark in, what, 1990 or something like that? 87. 87 um, which is a very nice book out of print now, I guess, um, on the definitive discovery of the quark and <clears throat> with a lot of uh, historical information. Uh, uh, he's a retired from um, professor from the University of Santa Cruz, uh, now doing history of science out of uh, Washington State, somewheres, and um, he will, uh, his, his title is Structure Function Separations and the Termination of Parton Spin. Well, it's a pleasure and an honor to be back here at MIT to see all my, uh, or many of my colleagues, mentors, and friends here to uh, hear my version of the uh, 
discovery of quarks. And uh, I'm going to be a bit different from the others. I'm going to look at it from the standpoint of a historian of physics who was embedded in one of the key experiments of our time. And I hope to share with you some of the uh, highlights and maybe some of the lowlights of my particular odyssey on the way to quarks. I joined the Friedman Kendall Group as a senior in uh, 19, let's see, 1967, doing a senior thesis on e elastic scattering with Paul Kirk. And yes, we uh, did a lot of the theoretical fits, but nothing seemed to do better than the uh, dipole fit that a couple of our speakers beforehand have talked about. Uh, and then uh, I joined the uh, the Friedman Kendall Group officially as a first year MIT grad student and worked on the uh, SLAC experiment E49B. This was the deep inelastic EP and ED scattering using the eight gem spectrometer. And I stayed on there. We, uh, we did another experiment, E87, uh, that uh, Ari talked about. And uh, I helped on the analysis of that and actually combined the, the analysis of that with the earlier experiments to come up with the structure function separations I'm going to talk about today. <clears throat> And then uh, I took about a 10-year detour through publishing, uh, trying to work up the courage to face the blank page and write this incredible story that I'd been in the midst of and it came out as The Hunting of the Quark. And I have to thank Ari because I ran out of uh, my advance on that book and he uh, gladly uh, brought me back into the fold in 1985 to work on uh, maybe what I'd call the third generation of deep and elastic scattering experiments at Slack. All right. <clears throat> now, uh, we've already seeing this quote from Galman, I think Marty showed it, but I want to remind you all of the, of the uh, skepticism about quarks because I was taking a course from uh, uh, Louis Osborne, Roy Schwitters was the, uh, the, the TA on this, exp on this uh, course on particle physics, and we used a book called Elementary Particle Physics by Stephen Gossiorowitz, and about halfway through, there's this, after maybe just a few pages on quarks, there's a statement, if such quark particles existed, whoops, sorry, if such quark particles existed, at least one of them would have to be stable. A search for new particles of this type has so far proved unsuccessful. In view of this failure and the difficulty of inventing a mechanism, he means QCD, uh, which would bind a quark and an anti-quark or three quarks, we will not discourse the, discuss the quark model further. And so we went on and talking about S matrix theory and Reggie poles and the vector dominance model for the next 100 pages or three or four weeks of the course. It gives you an idea of what the uh, theoretical uh, prejudices of the day were. Okay, now I'd like to the, two to the two papers we are celebrating today, the experimental paper, I'd like to add a third that came out earlier that year. BJ's uh, classic asymptotic sum rolls at infinite momentum, which was published in March of 1969, but uh, it was a culmination of maybe two years of theorizing giving presentations at conferences, at the uh, workshop, uh, every day giving it at Slack. This is really the first time he published the, uh, the, the idea of scaling, that the structure function should scale at high uh, nu and q squared. So uh, it, it is true that 1990 Nobel Prize in physics was awarded based largely on those last two papers. But I'd like to highlight uh, BJ's uh, contributions. Now, uh, you've seen one of these plots earlier. Uh, the, the, this is the 10 degree day. I think Marty showed you the 6 degree day. And I call this Slack's Marsden moment. This is recreating it to like Chris did. When Ernest Marsden, the graduate student under Rutherford, came back and said, well, I see about 1 in 8,000 uh, alpha particles scattering backwards. And then that was the, the famous quote from Rutherford about the 15-inch shell. Well, this was Slack's and Marsden moment. The experiment, as you can see, was really designed to look at the, um, the momentum transfer dependence of the residences. And, and they're falling off like a shot, just like, the, uh, just like the elastic scattering is doing. But in this deep inelastic range, where the, 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 the energy loss to the, uh, of the electron is over, uh, uh, is large over, you know, go up to 10 or 15 GeV, uh, you did not see that same dependence. And this was shown here. It's about two orders of magnitude larger than expected. Now, the, and uh, this was what, uh, at this point, 
the interest in the behavior of the nucleon resonances but it was largely abandoned, and the study of the deep inelastic region began. I would like to point out here, which people don't appreciate, was that the, the fact that this, uh, that the signal was so large, meant that the radiative corrections would be a smaller fraction of the total cross section and were feasible. If those cross sections had been small, I think they would have been buried underneath the radiative tails, and it might have been impossible. In fact, Barry Barish, when I interviewed him about the book, he said the reason that the Caltech group left the collaboration was they didn't think that the radiative corrections would be possible. OK, you've seen most of this here, uh, the, the kinematics of uh, deep and elastic scattering in the, in the one photon approximation. I'd like to put particular emphasis on the, uh, the fact that the doubly differential cross-section that we extracted could be related to the flux of transverse virtual photons times the, the absorption cross-sections for transverse and longitudinal uh, uh, photons. The virtual photon polarization epsilon here is uh, defined here. Uh, we didn't try to make the separations of the, structure, the structure fractions per se because the, the uh, because of this tan squared theta uh, factor, this was only one or two percent in the case of the six and 10 degree data. It was all the way over to uh, the right hand side of the spectrum. So we focused mainly on making separations of sigma t and sigma l. And we could do that uh, because r, the ratio of those two uh, uh, cross sections, was uh, equal to W2 over W1, the ratio of two cross sections. So you could, you could choose to extract either W2 or W1 or W2 and R, which is what we did. It was a lot easier to make the fits uh, to, the, uh, to, to the, 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 these cross sections. And I remind you, the Callan gross relation that Chris talked about said that R should be zero in the Bjorkane limit if you had spin one half cross sections, or it should go to infinity if uh, you had uh, spin zero. Uh, more generally, at finite Q squared and, and nu, uh, you get a, a, an expression like this. And Bob Jaffe was the one to help me to understand this. And particularly, if you had pure spin, I mean spin one half partons here, I left that out, then A of x was zero, B of x was one, and you got what was called the callan gross relation. R should be Q squared over nu squared. Well, uh, it was Guthrie Miller well, excuse me, here are the, uh, the, the spectrometers again. And the, uh, the, the 20 jet spectrometer could measure the scattered electrons out to 10 degrees and uh, as close in as maybe 4 degrees. That's the one in the background here. Uh, the 8 jet spectrometer, you see the bending magnets here, the blue in the blue, and the quadrupole magnets, the focusing magnets in red, would bend the scattered electrons and the background of pions up into this detector enclosure, where the, uh, the detectors largely made by MIT would discriminate pions from electrons. You could rotate this thing out to 90 degrees, but your counting rate essentially fell to zero, maybe one count per day, like Marty talked about, beyond about 35 degrees. So we didn't bother to go any much larger than 35. But the fact that you could cover between about four and 34 degrees allowed you to make these structure function separations. The HS spectrometer is a particularly ideal in this regard. It could run up, roll out in minutes to uh, much greater angles than 20. It, uh, its solid angle acceptance, uh, its uh, delta omega delta p, remained essentially unchanged. It was very rigid, as opposed to the 20 jet spectrometer, which had to be resurveyed and probably would take a day to do so. Uh, after you moved it from like six to four to 10 degrees. So it was much, much easier to do an experiment at large angles using the H of spectrometer. Uh, but the large Q squares that you, re you realized at high Q squared, at large theta, meant you had greater Q squared and the, 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 uh, cross, the counting rate was dropping like a shot. Okay. All right, so Guthrie Miller at, in Slack Group A was the first one to attempt to do this. He, uh, you can see the fits to the uh, differential cross section divided by the, the, the flux of transverse virtual photons, the ranges of epsilon he could cover. Uh, when you, the actual regions where you could make separations were substantially smaller than the total area over which we took data because, uh, be, because you needed an overlaps of three separate, at three separate angles. He would do, uh, we would all do, 
of uh, interpolations to the values of w and q squared, and then he would make the separations at those particular values. And he came up with a basically, you couldn't see much of a kinematic dependence. R was 0 0.18 plus or minus uh, 0.1, I think was the, the amount, not the, the systematic error in it. It was consistent with R equals Q squared over new squared, the Callan gross relation, but you really couldn't say much at all about the, uh, <coughs> the kinematic dependence. So uh, also in the, the Bjorkian scaling was measured in, uh, by, by Guthrie Miller. And again, assuming that was, W2 here is assuming that R equals 0.18. It's, you didn't do a separation of W1, W2. And uh, again, th this was noticed by group A primarily that you would actually see the scaling would work better if you use another kind of scaling variable that approached omega at large, uh, large new W, new and Q squared. You can see there's quite a bit of scatter in these data, and that's because of the fact that it's not really perfectly scaling there, which I will talk about more. Okay, again, Marty has shown this. No need to say more about it. Again, this is all assuming R is the average value of 0.18. Okay, all right, the second generation experiments. This is where Ari and I came in, all right? I like to think of the experiment that Marty did and Guthrie Miller did as the first generation. And we came out of that, we could say, we're hitting something hard and tiny inside the proton. It, Feynman calls them partons. They could be quarks. But we needed to measure the quark, the properties, the quark, excuse me, the parton uh, the quantum numbers. And so Ari, uh, the PhD thesis was, let's, what are the charges? And mine was, what are the spins? All right, E49, we came in for E49B is where Ari and I stepped in right here. And we were not working with Group A anymore, we were working with Slack Spectrometer Facilities Group under David Coward. Group A went down to make measurements at smaller angles. And then uh, we did a, another threshold experiment, E87, uh, in 1972 to measure the behavior as x goes to 1, which was emerging as a very interesting area. Bill Atwood, which I'll talk about later, did measurements at 50 and 60 degrees uh, with the, using the 1.6 gem spectrometer to uh, <coughs> measure the scattering of the electrons. It was really meant to be a, uh, a detector to measure the, the scattered uh, nucleons or protons. All right, this is a plot from my PhD thesis, 1973. Uh, the data that I got, I had a, a mesh of chosen points at, of Q squared and W squared. And uh, you can see here that uh, it's consistent with the callan gross relation at X greater than 0.2. And something funny, something different is going on at X uh, less than 0.2. And I was kind of discouraged that this was all I could come up with. I mean, it didn't seem to me to be a much, a much of an improvement over uh, what uh, Guthrie Miller had done with the previous uh, uh, experiment. The average I came up with, I think, was 0.14. Uh, but then, uh, and okay, I, I've, I could also make the statement that R, D, uh, that the R for the deuteron is exa almost exactly the same as R for the proton within errors. And therefore, I could conclude that R for the proton, neutron, and neutron were everywhere consistent with each other. But then a letter came in from Dick Feynman addressed to Henry Kendall. And he was very interested in R. As you know, I am very anxious to see the data on R. I'm only thinking the conventional thoughts, the behavior of R versus the new, and X can tell us whether the charged partons of which the protons are made are purely spun one half, in which case the scaling law is that new R is a function solely of X. Or if there are some scalar partons, in which case R itself should scale. R itself should be a function only of X. And that really got me going. Because I had another mesh, uh, intending to study scaling, I had another mesh of points that were along constant x or constant omega versus nu or q squared. And I actually chatted with Bob Jaffe. He gave me a more general fit. He was working with, a, I think it was Jack Gunyon on a paper, both spin zero and spin one half partons uh, could be included. And so I was the one that got to send that uh, data to, uh, to uh, Dick Feynman and, <coughs> Along comes this uh, letter in early June 1973, just after I'd gotten my PhD. Dear Dr. Reardon, thank you very much for the detailed description of R. I have no questions, as the results are so completely described. This is the first letter I ever got as a newly minted PhD in physics, and boy, did it lift my spirits. And indeed, you know, he goes through, and he, you know, he's also interested in what's happening at the, uh, at the low values of X. Uh, I expect scaling to work 
for a new R only as large as, as long as Q squared is large. And therefore, trying to go along and continue to suppose that all charged partons are one half, et cetera. Well, uh, we finally published that uh, data in 1974. It took a while to actually uh, get there. This is about a year later we published the data. Where's, yeah, I received May 16th, 1974. And you see the behavior at, at uh, small omega, now we go two equal five, corresponding to large x, is almost entirely consistent with scaling with the Kellen Gross relation. But yes, you know, there is something happening at uh, low, uh, at, at large omega or low x, which could be interpreted as spin zero behavior, but also could be thrown away as just where you're still looking at the approach to scaling. Okay. Uh, uh, let me get on to the scaling uh, test, because this is what the second thing I wanted to do with my thesis. You know, and the first I was just using E49A, E49B data, and indeed, we could start to see some scaling violations. And I particularly remember papers by, uh, by Sid Drell and his uh, colleagues saying that if we had a realistic parton model with the interactions between the partons, partons, then we had to see some kind of scaling violations. You know, that, that scaling violations, if they were pure and simple, corresponded to completely free partons, which was not reasonable in any field theory. And indeed, we, we began to see scaling violations. These data are kind of messy, uh, because I had to use the, the, uh, the, 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 the 20 Jeff spectrometer data and the 8 Jeff spectrometer data, and I had to normalize the two which was difficult to do. I mean, how do I, you know, they could be off by a percent or two. And I actually had a uh, uh, normalization factor that it took me half a year to work out uh, by comparing the elastic cross sections measured in both experiments. And even that had an error. You know, it was, that was 1.02 plus or minus 0.2. And you see a lot of jumpiness in the data here. And again, as Ari said, uh, we tried to publish this uh, in physical review and they rejected it and we had to send it to physics letters. Okay. But if you just use the eight Jeb spectrometer, you didn't have to worry about those normalization problems. And you, when I put the 49B and the 87 data together, then you really began to see the pattern that was uh, predicted in QCT of a logarithmic fall off at uh, large x versus Q squared and a rise at small x. You saw that in uh, one of the last slides that Chris showed you. And again, at x of 0.5, you know, yeah, that's that omega of 4 that was in Guthrie Miller's data. It's uh, pretty flat. Now, uh, let me just uh, bring it to a close here. Uh, uh, Bill Atwood did this study using the uh, 1.6 gem spectrometer, did the whole detector package. It really was a tour de force of a you know, Stanford University graduate student. And at those angles of 50 and 60 degrees, they're beginning to be dominated by uh, w1, all right? And he, so you, you could see these scaling violations if you used, excuse me, if you used x as your scaling variable, it was a very clear fall off. Uh, and uh, even in this uh, group A scaling variable of x prime, a clear fall off, maybe not logarithmic. You could concoct another scaling variable, and they always did, they always did uh, in which you could actually see, you know, no scaling violations. But that was getting pretty strained at this point. And we're now up to Q squares. He was getting up to Q squares of around 30, which is uh, quite large compared to what we could have done with the, uh, with the HF spectrometer. Anyway, to bring a long story to the end, I'd like to mention, uh, and I already mentioned it too, that in the mid-1980s, about the time I came back into the field, Ari uh, got the empty target data from the uh, the earlier experiments, I think it was E4DA9B, right? That you got the MP tar? Hmm? Both, both data. And reanalyze it. What he didn't say is he had to look high and wide all over the whole country to find a computer or a tape drive that could respin those, tape, those tapes. And he finally found what an Argon National Laboratory. We were analyzing the data, you know, we would spin the tapes on the old 7090, 7094 down in the basement of uh, Building 24. And so he had a, that, that was the real uh, tour de force of that. Then we came back and did uh, two E49, E139 and E140, which uh, really did a, a detailed study in electron scattering of what has become known as the EMC effect, that quarks inside the proton of the 
inside the nuclei don't behave exactly the same way as they do in free neutrons and protons. And finally, we got to do what I had advocated to do in my PhD thesis, a, an experiment devoted to make a precision measurement of R, using the fact that you could move that EGF spectrometer all over the place and you know, put it you know, down at any angle you wanted very quickly and be re reliable that the uh, cross sections, excuse me, that the acceptance would be the same. Okay, so finally, this thing has been shown before. But I want to make some, I want to repeat the, the point that was made that this was a real team effort. All right, and in fact, Cecilia Jarlskog, who was the chair of the uh, Nobel Prize Committee, uh, put it in, in her presentation before the king and queen and everybody else in Stockholm. The three prize winners were key persons in a research team, uh, that's my emphasis, which in a series of investigations found clear signs that there exists an in inner structure in the protons and neutrons of the atomic nucleus. And let me just say, okay, uh, here's Jerry, Henry, and Dick uh, kneeling down in the front row, as they should be. But the other players on this team, Pete Panofsky, he got the National Medal of Science for building and uh, you know, managing slack through its uh, glory days. We have not one, not two, but three unshared winners of the Panofsky Prize, the greatest prize, in, and that's Ari, Marty, and Bill Atwood in this thing. We also have in the background B.J. Bjorkain, who recently got the Wolf Prize, widely regarded as a precursor to the Nobel Prize in physics. And some of us were, uh, you know, uh, betting that maybe he was going to get it this time, but it didn't happen, and maybe the next time. Anyway, this was really an incredible team. It was a pleasure to work with them. And uh, in closing, I have a confession to make. I have been accused of some insider trading on this prize. And uh, now it can be told, <laughs> okay. I was, a, uh, I was at a cocktail party in uh, May of, no, it was in June of 1989. At the, it was the uh, 50th anniversary no, the 25th anniversary of the uh, CP violation. It was held in the, uh, like the uh, just outside of uh, Paris in the uh, castle of De Blois. And Cecilia comes up to me, and she says, I read your book. <laughs> and we'd like to award a Nobel Prize for that, for the discovery of quarks. We just don't know who to give it to. I said, well, that's easy. You're the Jerry, Henry, and Dick. They're the, you're, they're the chiefs. We were the Indians. <laughs> and uh, uh, little did I know that she was the head of the uh, committee at that time. And, but uh, I later learned that Peef was being considered, as was BJ. There were really five people, and you can only give it to three. And what they did, as I learned from uh, Gosta Exbong at one of the uh, that one of the parties, of the many parties that were held, that they really based it on whose names were on those two key papers. And, you know, Panofsky's could have been on, but he took his name off that paper because he said, well, I became a bureaucrat. And then, as we know, B.J. had given the whole theoretical framework in which we operated. He really deserved to be a part of that team, and I certainly hope he wins it one day. Anyway, I can, I'd like to end just with the, uh, by plugging my book, The Hunting of the Quark, is now back in print in a revised and updated edition, although, no, it's in electrons. There's an electronic version you can get from Plunkett Lake Press. Uh, you can get the old paperback for $5 on Amazon, or you can get, if you want to pay $9.99, you can get the uh, updated electronic edition that shows that, has a uh, epilogue about the uh, road to Stockholm. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Nice talk. Uh, do we have any questions? Anybody want any comments? Long ones? Yeah, there's a light. Is there one in the back? This is a non-technical question, but what was the reaction of the skeptics and non-believers 
after you know the discovery? Well, that's that's a really interesting question. Uh, I mean, I can't say you know individually, but you know historians of science like to talk about how a, commu a community comes to consensus. There's a wonderful book just out from Princeton University Press uh, by Naomi Oreskes, student of Peter Gallison's, with whom we had coffee this morning. And, you know, uh, and, and she presents a, what is called a social constructivist version of science, which a lot of physicists react pretty strongly against. But uh, she makes the point that when a diverse, skeptical community comes to consensus, that's believable science, as happened with the case of quarks. In the late, in the late 1970s, uh, the evidence had become so overwhelming, not just from these experiments, but from the JSI discovery. There were other experiments in neutrino scattering. I already talked a little bit about them. There was this many, many little pieces that came together by the late 1960s, and the community said, yeah, it's time we believed in them. Okay. I think I think one of the one of the things that bothered people in the uh, when this first came out was that we expected that anything that was fundamental like that I could pick one up and put it in your hand. Yeah. And you cannot do that for quarks. And the problem was nobody knew what the theoretical mechanism was that prevented you from having a quark that I could pick up and hand to Ed or Michael, excuse me, uh, in, in, in his hand. And it took five, six years, maybe even a little longer, for the theorists to catch up to the experimentalists. <laughs> and at some stage of the game, finally, the theorists gave up trying to prove an alternative. There was never a question, and this is important for the young experimenters, there was never a question raised that we did the experiment wrong. The analysis was done independently at MIT and at SLAC. Uh, we did not talk to one another about the analysis or in group meetings and so on. And when the dust all settled and we looked at each other's results, they were identical or matched well within experimental errors. So there was never a question about the experiment itself, the question that drove everybody up the wall was what does it mean? What's the, what, what, what's the, uh, what do the results mean? And it, it just took a while for theory to catch up to us. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think it's necessary to mention QCD and I hope Bob Jaffe will say more about it, but it, it finally gave us a mechanism, a credible mechanism by which the quarks did not come out. That was the great, uh, that, that was the paradox of the time about 1973. Okay, we seem to be hitting these things. They seem to be free. They seem to have uh, spin one half and fractional charges. How come we don't see them leaving a track in one of our detectors? We needed a solid theoretical reason. And we began to see the evidence for what, the, the, they made predictions that you would see logarithmic scaling violations. We began to see the evidence for that. But I, I have to admit that we really could not convince the community in 1974-75 that what we were seeing was not the approach to scaling. And we didn't have enough lever arm in Q-squared. It really took the uh, muon scattering experiments at both uh, CERN and Fermilab and the, some of the neutrino scattering experiments to establish scaling violations beyond a shadow of a doubt. Oh, okay. Yes, I, I wanted to add to this that, I mean, at the beginning, we just had scattering electrons. We yeah. didn't know what the final state looked like. Yeah. And that was controversial. I think BJ was the first person probably to figure out, well, the parton model said there'd be one parton. That was obviously wrong because it would have non-integral charge. But the idea that there were quarks, you know, with part on the quark charge was trickling back and you'd have a jet. I mean, Yang wrote a paper saying it won't look like that. Mm -hmm. It's going to look quite different. It was not obvious that the final state, I don't, what, what year did you first measure the structure of the final state? Does anybody remember? I don't know. Um, it was in the early 70s, certainly. Yeah. Before, 
And that was quite important because until you knew that, you know, you didn't know what problem you were solving, mm -hmm. which was, in fact, how to get the charge back down the jet, it turned out. And that was sort of understood to a large extent since I'm speaking for BJ today. BJ had a lot to do with that. Okay. Okay. Okay, let's thank the speaker again. And our next speaker will be Bob Jaffe, who's, uh, we've got 25 minutes, the bell will ring. And we have to get his, uh, yep. Uh, Bob was a graduate student at SLAC. Uh, Sid Drell was his thesis advisor, uh, 68 to 72, right? Or was it seven, mm -hmm. 68 to 72? Uh, so he was right in the mix of, mix of things, trying to understand what was going on as well as the rest of us. And uh, from deep inelastic scattering to the bag model. What do I do? Well, it's a pleasure to be here, and thanks to the organizers for asking me to speak. Um, it's also a pleasure to be, I think, arguably the youngest person in the list of speakers. It's not a common occurrence for me in modern day. Um, but it does actually reflect a little bit on the passage of time, that you're getting a perspective on this physics from people who were very young at the time that it took place. And uh, it influenced a lot of our lives in important ways. Um, I. Uh, entered high school and first encountered the proton in 1960. I entered college in 1964, the time when George and Murray uh, first, uh, well, 1963, um, first put out the uh, idea of quarks. Uh, I entered graduate school in Stanford in 1968, the year that uh, the Vienna Conference data was presented uh, showing scaling and deep and elastic scattering. And I left Stanford for MIT in 1972, the year that Murray uh, gave a talk at the International Conference in High Energy Physics uh, summarizing the structure of quantum chromodynamics. Um, being the last speaker gives me some advantage. I get the last word, um, but I also get to say some of the same things that other people have said already. Um, I'm, my talk is going to be focused on a particular aspect of the follow-on to deep and elastic scattering, which is the search for a semi-quantitative, intuitive, uh, pictorial description of the proton. Um, this picture that I'm showing here um, is going to be appear from time to time. Uh, this is the picture of the proton as I first encountered it in 1960 when I entered high school. Um, the idea of a heuristic uh, description following upon a great discovery is something that we can see in the work of Rutherford. In 1900, the idea of, of an internal structure to the atom was really quite uncertain. It was known that there were electrons, and it was known there was some kind of positive background. Uh, but other than that, uh, the picture was, uh, this paradigm was not very predictive and not very full. Uh, after Rutherford's work, a new paradigm emerged. Uh, the nucleus was at the center of the atom. The electrons were uh, in orbits that were predicted by Bohr's early quantum theory. And those electron orbitals around a central nucleus formed the fundamental structure of an atom which was embellished and improved and elaborated into our present uh, very rich uh, theory of atomic structure. If I can get these going the right way unintuitively. So back to the proton, or fast forward from Rutherford's experiment to the proton in 1960. Uh, what we knew about the proton is nicely summarized by the elastic electron scattering experiments uh, uh, led by Robert Hofstadter at SLAC in the 1950s. What they showed is that the cross-section fell rapidly with momentum transfer, indicating that the proton was some kind of diffuse, fragile structure that broke up when you hit it. And when it broke up, it broke up into other hadrons, into mesons, baryon antibaryons, mesons of all kind, baryon resonances. 
Uh, it did not break up into some kind of sub-constituents. And from this arose a picture, which is called the hadronic bootstrap, that hadrons are not fundamental objects, but instead they are some kind of uh, internal um, uh, composites of one another, that the proton is made of other hadrons and other hadrons are made of protons, um, that the uh, there's that they represent in some sense a unique solution to some very general constraints, constraints of Lorentz invariance, of causality and unitarity. And if you put those all together and really understood them, you would come up with a unique spectrum of strongly interacting particles and their interactions. Uh, this picture uh, began to change in 1961 with Gelman and Neyman's observation that the proton was belonged in a family. Uh, they showed us that the family of similar baryons included seven other states with different charges and strangeness, but they didn't tell us anything about the substructure of the proton. They didn't give us any handle. As far as we knew, these were uh, similar states that emerged in a self-consistent coherent solution to the bootstrap equations. Uh, in 1964, uh, things changed in a dramatic way with the idea that there were three uh, more fundamental particles, the up, down, and strange quarks, and that somehow, uh, in some undetermined way, the proton and the other particles in the families of hadrons were made up of those underlying constituent particles. This really ushered in a period of turmoil in particle physics. The period from 1964 to 1973 was one of uh, constant uh, contradiction and changing paradigms. Uh, most, as other people have said in this uh, conference so far, most people didn't take the idea of dynamical quarks very seriously. A few people did. One of the leaders in this was Dick Dowlitz at Oxford. Um, he and others took the idea of physical dynamical quarks very seriously. They put simple interactions among non-relativistic quarks and predicted the spectrum of excitations of those systems of three quarks and quark anti-quark. And they found that there was a strong indication of agreement with the spectrum of the hadrons that had been observed. Uh, they had a problem that there were no free quarks, uh, no free quarks had been observed. And they uh, replied that quarks must be very tightly bound inside protons. But even an under elementary understanding of relativistic quantum mechanics indicated that if you bind particles very tightly, they get strongly renormalized, that their properties are no longer the simple free properties of the particles that you put in. Uh, so the idea of taking uh, straightforward linear superpositions of these quarks and building hadrons out of them uh, seemed to be unsupported by the underlying dynamics. Um, furthermore, there was the problem of uh, the uh, Fermi of the statistics of the quarks. All these pictures made sense if quarks obeyed Bose statistics, but quarks are supposed to be spin a half particles and supposed to obey Fermi statistics. And with Fermi statistics, you couldn't get the spectrum right. Uh, so there was the problem of non-relativistic dynamics. There was the problem of statistics. And finally, there was the fact that this made no sense in light of the dominant paradigm at the time, uh, the hadronic bootstrap, that particles were fundamentally made of each other and not made of something more fundamental uh, like a constituent quark. Uh, this is a, a slide I just want to indicate the kind of work that Dalitz and his collaborators did. This is a, a transparency taken from Dalitz's uh, rapporteur's talk in the International Conference on High Energy Physics in 1966. This is a simple table of the, pro of the classification of baryon resonances. Here is a more modern version for, taken from 2005. Things haven't changed so much since then of the classification of baryon resonances in terms of uh, the simple quark model. Uh, it's an elegant and relatively complete um, description of the excited states of baryons. One of the features I'd like to focus in on here is that the observed states of hadrons could be associated with the quantum excitations of quarks. There was no evidence for any other degrees of freedom in the system. In particular, there was no evidence for some kind of geometrical excitation of the system, no breathing modes of a uh, system with collective degrees of freedom. 
Um, this is, uh, to my mind, uh, an excellent example of a piece of uh, his history of science advocated by Tom Kuhn, who, by the way, was also a professor here at MIT for many years. Um, there was a, uh, a paradigm that was inspiring lots of ordinary scientific work, this bootstrap, uh, hadronic bootstrap paradigm. People were writing papers about Reggie poles and analytic structure of scattering amplitudes. Um, and at the same time, there was a subgroup uh, of people, uh, like Dalitz and, and others, who were writing papers uh, that they didn't really understand in a coherent and theoretical framework that they could defend wholly. Um, but they were getting results that were intriguing and unable to be obtained in a simple way from the other description. Uh, th this uh, situation reached a cusp, uh, I think, in the 1966 Berkeley High Energy Physics Conference, and I've taken a couple of quotes to illustrate that. Uh, this is a quote you've seen before today. This is Murray Gelman's introductory talk. He says, we now consider three hypothetical and probably fictitious quarks. Now, what's going on? What are these quarks? Uh, this part I won't read since it's been said before. It's hard to, uh, to see how these quarks could be fundamental since in the sense of dispersion theory, they're mostly, if not entirely, made up of each other. Uh, thus, it seems that whether or not real quarks exist, the Q and Q bar that we've been talking about are mathematical entities. Contrast that with what Dalit said. Dalit gave the review talk on uh, symmetries and strong interactions. He said, this provides us with an unfamiliar situation, but one which has much qualitative correspondence with the experimental data. The hadron should be regarded as rather analogous to molecules whose constituent atoms are quarks. Such a model appears especially unfamiliar in terms of the conventional ideas of field theory today. If it works well, then it will be the task of field theory to show how such a model can arise from some field theory. Bogdan Moglich, a famous experimenter at the time, asked a question in the question session after Dalitz's talk. Does this model rely on the existence of physical quarks? And Dalitz was unequivocal. He said, if there do not exist real particles, this model has no interest. So contrast what Miguelman was saying with what Dalitz was saying at the same conference, two of the leaders in the field. Um, an interesting uh, prediction of where things were going can be found in Sid Drell's talk on the electromagnetic interactions. He was the rapporteur for that subject. He said, what would I like to see measured? I'd very much like to see some inelastic electron or muon cross sections measured. Also, there are some sum rules, asymptotic statements derived by Bjorkane and others as to how these inelastic cross sections behave in energy, which can be checked experimentally. So I want to turn to Bjorkane's work in 1966, which I don't think has uh, received much attention here. I think the 1966 paper by Bjorkane on applications of chiral, it's got a very obscure title, chiral U6 cross U6 algebra of current densities. Uh, what Bjorkane did is use a method of extracting the high energy behavior of scattering amplitudes uh, that he and independently Francis Lowe and Ken Johnson, it's called the Bjorkane-Johnson Lowe limit, uh, derived earlier to take, uh, to make predictions for the high energy behavior of lots of processes involving leptons, not only uh, electron scattering, inelastic electron scattering that we're talking about today, but also E plus E minus annihilation, the high energy corrections to the proton neutron mass difference, hyperfine structure of hydrogen, a list of about half a dozen processes, each one of which has become a field of deep and elastic physics over the past 50 years. And he used the predictions of the uh, limit that he and uh, Johnson and Lowe had derived, but he assumed the currents were built out of quark fields, and he ignored the interactions between the quarks at short distances. He simply calculated using free field theory. And he predicted large cross sections for electron scattering, as people have mentioned. Here's one example. We conjecture that the cross section per unit Q squared goes like one over Q to the fourth. You'll Recognize that as pure dimensional analysis. Nothing, no scale in that problem except the units. Uh, this data has been shown. This is the earth shattering data from the, uh, from the SLAC collaborations that PIEF showed in 1968 in Vienna. And this quote has been uh, shown before. I'll just read the last bit. Therefore, theoretical speculations are focused on the possibility 
that these data might give evidence on the behavior of point-like charge structures within the nucleon. It's too bad Jerry Friedman didn't get to say that. Um, then after 1968, uh, as this new idea of quark structure was coalescing, uh, a very strange paradigm began to emerge, namely that nature somehow for these strongly interacting particles that are permanently confined nevertheless read books on free field theory. Um, the puzzle was that the predictions of the SLAC experiment could be obtained if you took quarks that were otherwise free but permanently confined and calculated as if those were your degrees of freedom. Uh, this was the essence of the Parton model. It was the essence of the more complicated and obscure uh, formalism that Fritsch, Gelman, Callan, Gross, and Jakeef, and Llewellyn Smith, and I used to check our calculations, or at least the ones we showed in public, um, based on uh, Wilson's operator product expansion and uh, free field singularities near the light cone. It predicted exact Bjorkane scaling. Um, here's uh, so, some of the data that Mike Reardon just showed. Uh, it also could be used to predict some rules for the quark momentum fraction, as Chris described, the baryon number, the spin, and so on. And Murray summarized this in lectures he gave in 1971 at the Coral Gables conference. He said, all these conclusions are easy to accept if we draw our intuition from certain quark field theories without interactions or from certain field theories with naive manipulation of operators. However, detailed calculations using the renormalized perturbation expansions in renormalizable field theories do not reveal any of these sorts of behavior. If we accept the conclusions, therefore, we should probably think not in terms of renormalized perturbation expansion, but rather to conclude, so to speak, that nature reads books on free field theory as far as the Bjorkane limit is concerned. So from that period emerged our modern understanding of quantum chromodynamics. Um, I have two slides here just to summarize where that went. The most of this, some of this is well known. I'd like to emphasize that the pieces of quantum chromodynamics were in place. Uh, gauge theories, of course, were worked out by Yang and Mills in the 1950s. Quarks were introduced in 63 and 64. The idea that the interactions between quarks had to be mediated by vector particles was strongly supported by the structure of chiral symmetry violation throughout the 1960s. Color and the idea that hadrons had to be color singlets in order to not have fractionally charged hadrons uh, was encoded in the parastatistics work of, Go of Greenberg in 64 um, and was made quite explicit in the work of Nambu, uh, which was published in 1966. Um, the uh, tools to evaluate perturbative corrections to deep inelastic scattering began with Wilson's operator product expansion in 68 with the help of Callan and Zemancic's equations for operator evolution at high energy in 1970. And finally, an elegant paper by Chris Hoslocker and Mueller in 1972 that basically instructed any user how to calculate uh, perturbative corrections to deep inelastic scattering for an arbitrary quantum field theory. Um, in 1972, Murray put this all together in a talk he gave at the International Conference on High Energy Physics at Fermilab, um, and that is the uh, signpost for the birth of quantum chromodynamics. Um, it's really interesting to read in Murray's talk what he has to say about quarks and the bootstrap. He says, the simplest and most obvious advantage of two Two is quantum chromodynamics, the Lagrangian for QCD, um, over one, which was some theory with uh, uh, gluons that did not carry color and therefore would be observed in the real world. The advantage is that now gluons are just as factitious as quarks. So this is 1972, and he was still uh, not willing to concede the reality of quarks, although those of us who were doing work with deep inelastic scattering had been forced kicking and screaming into believing that quarks are real. And he goes on to say, the resulting picture could be equivalent to that emerging from the bootstrap duality approach in which quarks and gluons are not mentioned initially, provided the baryons and mesons then turn out to behave as though they were composed of quarks and gluons. It's really interesting. Um, now, to some extent, the rest is history. Um, 
This is a slide uh, 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 summarizing between 1973 and today. That's only 45 years. Um, perturbative QCD was developed. Uh, Gross, Wilczek, and Pollitzer plugged, in, plugged their beta function into the work of uh, Chris Toslocker and Mueller and showed that QCD interactions get weaker in short distances. Um, it turned out to be do, it possible to do reliable calculations at short distances. Logarithmic violations of Bjorkane scaling were predicted and observed. And now there's a wonderful industry of making predictions for high energy and high momentum transfer collisions uh, of hadrons based on quantum chromodynamics. Uh, on the more rigorous point of view, well, not that this isn't rigorous, but on, on the more perhaps fundamental point of view, um, the lattice QCD developed from ideas of uh, Wilson's in, 1960, in 1974, implemented using Monte Carlo uh, methods by, Kra by Kreutz originally in 1980, and have led to ever improving numerical calculations of hadron properties and interactions. Uh, here's just one graph of the spectrum of uh, the uh, light baryons and mesons coming from uh, extensive lattice QCD calculation. So, what about the proton? Um, what have we learned about a heuristic description of the substructure of hadrons from this, or what came out of this? This leads me to where we were when I came to MIT in 1972. I actually came uh, largely in response to the enthusiastic endorsement from Ken Johnson, who had been visiting SLAC in 1970 and convinced me that MIT was a great place to do physics. Um, a group led by Ken Johnson of three young uh, postdocs, Charles Thorne, Alan Chodos, and me. Um, this is the only one picture I could find that dates from the same period. These guys are older, are, were younger then than they are now. Um, and very much mentored and with the uh, overarching advice of Vicky Weisskopf, uh, who had a wonderful feel for the uh, physics of uh, quarks and confinement. Um, the idea was uh, to try to find a picture in which confinement was natural, um, even though quarks were weakly interacting. So we came up with the idea that we should think of hadrons as a region of space in which quarks and gluon fields are confined. Um, these this formalism left no place for single quark states, so the picture automatically accounted for the absence of hadrons with fractional charge like quarks. Um, let me say a word about that. Uh, the, I have to go back a minute to talk about the old paradigm of uh, the bootstrap. In studying the low energy interactions of mesons, uh, the constraints of analyticity and unitarity led uh, Gabriele Veneziano to invent a scattering amplitude for pions at low energies uh, that satisfied all those constraints. And uh, it was shown shortly afterwards that that was the scattering amplitude for relativistic massless strings uh, off of one another. And the idea emerged that hadrons should be thought of as the geometrical excitations of strings uh, the problem with that is that the spectrum of hadrons is the spectrum of quarks, not the, spec not the spectrum of the quantum states of an oscillating string. Uh, so uh, this is a picture of the degrees of freedom. So here's a string with, say, quarks on either end. Uh, it has two transverse degrees of freedom of oscillation, and one would expect to find uh, those oscillation states in the spectrum. Well, one could cut down on the number of degrees of freedom of transverse oscillation by replacing a string with a membrane. Then in three dimensions, there's only one direction of oscillation that's physical. Uh, or, uh, as Johnson suggested, one could replace the membrane by a blob, a three-dimensional domain in a three-dimensional space, and it has no geometric degrees of freedom. Well, a blob invites you to define a quark and gluon field over that domain. And then you have a picture that could be graphed on to certain pictures in statistical mechanics uh, having to do with condensation uh, in uh, 
ground states of complex field theories. So the idea of the bag model emerged from taking an extended object, this case a three-dimensional generalization of a string in a membrane, and I want to emphasize how important the existing old paradigm of uh, geometric, had, geometric descriptions of hadrons was in forming that model. Um, and they, those string and membrane models told us how to build the action of those systems in a relativistically covariant way. But uh, by saturating the dimensions of the system in the dimensions of space, that is a blob, there are no geometrical degrees of freedom. But now there are quark and gluon fields defined over the interior of the system. So you have the picture here is then a system of quarks and gluons that live inside a geometrical domain with a vacuum outside. Now that turns out to be a phenomenon that's familiar in uh, superconductivity. Uh, the vacuum of a type one superconductor excludes electric fields, uh, excuse me, excludes magnetic fields. So uh, magnetic fields have to form tubes that begin and end uh, on magnetic poles. Uh, in QCD, apparently, the vacuum of QCD has a dual, that is color uh, electric exchanged with magnetic, so it has a color Meissner effect in that the true vacuum of QCD excludes color electric fields in the same way that a vacuum of a superconductor excludes ordinary electric magnetic fields. Um, the energy density between the true vacuum and the vacuum interior to this region where the fields uh, are allowed to live defines, good, thank you, um, defines uh, the single constant necessary to formulate this theory. It's called the bag constant. That energy difference uh, is phenomenologically of order of 150 MeV per cubic Fermi. This sets the scale for the confining pressure on quark and gluon states and determines the overall scale of hadronic interactions. Notice this is a very low energy scale compared to the energies probed at deep and elastic scattering. So the quarks probed over this energy and deep and elastic scattering would show very little sign of these in confining interactions. Of course, with both quarks and gluons in this domain, the perturbative uh, uh, effects, residual effects of the gluon interactions between quarks would give rise to the ordinary scaling violation that had that was soon to be observed at SLAC. Um, so uh, the model can be formulated uh, in a uh, quite a rigorous way at the classical level. I'm flashing this slide for any theorists in the audience. This is the action for a simple bag model. There's the QCD Lagrangian and one additional term, a constant, defined over the region of space where the action is non-zero. So this theta function is one inside the bag and zero outside the bag. If you vary this canonically in, in the usual fashion, you get QCD equations inside the domain and you get uh, boundary conditions. The boundary conditions are really interesting. The quark boundary condition forbids quarks to flow across the boundary. The gluon boundary condition forbids gluon field to flow across the boundary. And the, another boundary condition sets the pressure generated by the quarks and gluons equal to the vacuum pressure, the bag constant. Um, this system uh, looks like a nice classical system. It's got one very deep problem, and that it's an over-constrained dynamical system for any fixed volume. If you were to fix a volume, it's possible to solve quantum field theory with these linear boundary conditions, but then the pressure would not balance the vacuum pressure. In order to balance the vacuum pressure, the, dynamic, the volume itself has to evolve dynamically um, and so the system is, the geometry is completely constrained by the uh, dynamics of the quark and gluon fields. That is necessary in order to involve geometric degrees of freedom, ge geometric excitations, which are not observed in the spectrum of hadrons. But it makes it, as a fundamental theory, extremely difficult to solve. So this did not evolve into a theory of hadrons. Instead, it evolved into a phenomenology, phenomenology of hadrons. It evolved into a heuristic model of hadrons. Uh, lots of interesting work was done by lots of groups over the past 30 or 40 years. I just mentioned a few of them here. Uh, simple models of the ground state of hadrons as spherical bags allowed uh, the uh, estimates of baryon masses, magnetic moments, and axial charges some problems that had never been understood before, like the reason that the axial charge of the proton is not five-thirds, 
were immediately clear in this picture. Um, systems at high angular momentum, as these, this is a, a bag meson rather than a proton, uh, spinning at high angular momentum had linear regi trajectories as, as required by data. Um, it provided a playground for looking and it gave people the fortitude to look at problems that had beforehand been looked too uh, daunting to be considered in quantum chromodynamics, so it was possible to look at exotic hadrons, uh, at the possibility of states made purely of glue, uh, the dynamics of correlated die quarks, uh, weak interaction matrix elements that are essential in order to understand CP violations, such as the KK bar mixing matrix element could be evaluated or estimated in this, these models. Quark matter and quark stars could be estimated in these models. So time is running out and I'm not gonna go into detail on the successes of the bag model or the limitations, but I'd like to close with a couple of final thoughts. Um, the picture of hadrons that uh, when I entered in 1960 was through the 1970s replaced by a kind of heuristic picture of up, down and strange uh, quarks, in this case a proton, so two ups and a down uh, in some kind of bag. Almost every picture you'll find if you do a, a search on uh, the internet for images of the proton will show quarks in a bag. Um, as time has gone on in, the rec in recent years, that picture has become progressively more complicated as further studies in deep and elastic phenomena show that the uh, uh, proton contains intrinsic quark-antiquark -quark pairs, contains gluons that carry spin as well as momentum. <laughs> And uh, as this complication has left us with uh, very little beyond this uh, simple original bag model picture uh, for a heuristic description of the light, the, especially the relativistic up, down, and strange quarks, uh, hadrons that are made of the light uh, quarks, as opposed to the heavy quarks, which can be viewed in a kind of QCD potential model. So I think it's fitting to close with a comment from BJ uh, BJ called this kind of QCD voodoo QCD. Um, you can't kill it. Um, <laughs> he also said, uh, charmingly, uh, the MIT bag model has gone from being, that should be being, not begin, from being a model to being part of the folklore without passing through the interme intermediate stage of being a theory. <laughs> so, <laughs> So it gave us a reason to understand confinement and a simple picture of confined quarks and explained why individual isolated quarks couldn't be observed. But it left us without a calculational framework that's strong enough to translate these ideas into quantitative descriptions for the hadron spectrum and interactions. For that, we still rely on lattice QCD at its core to do these dynamical calculations uh, in detail. So thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. Do we have any questions? That was a very nice talk. I want to get a better understanding of what the status, the current status of the bag model is. Is it that you can't calculate with it that's the problem, or is there some <laughs> fundamental uh, difficulty with it so it can't actually be correct? In other words, you said that somehow the pressures don't match of the vacuum with the stuff that's inside the bag. So I was left with the impression that the model uh, might actually be wrong. Is, is that an incorrect uh, impression? Uh, I, think, I think that there's no demonstrable reason, and some of the younger theorists in the, in the audience may have a comment on this. There's no demonstrable reason to think the model is fundamentally wrong. If it could be implemented and calculated uh, in some uh, field theoretic framework, it's relativistic, it's dynamically consistent. The problem is that as a uh, dynamical system, it's uh, nonlinear and over-constrained. What about this business that you mentioned that pressures don't match? That's if you assume a shape. So the, the shape has to be determined dynamically. As, a, as quarks, in, if you hit a quark in a bag, it moves toward the boundary of the bag, and the boundary of the bag moves with I, it. I see. So it's just, it's a comp, it's more It's a complex nonlinear dynamical so, system. Okay, so then the second question is, if you use these ideas as a, a heuristic description, 
Does it make predictions that are not correct? <laughs> um, usually the approximations that are made are so, are so oversimplifying that it's hard to criticize the predictions in detail. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, the, for example, the ground state baryons are modeled as spherical bags. That's clearly an a artificial approximation. But with that approximation, you get a spectrum of ground state hadrons, which you would find very satisfying. The spectrum of vector mesons, the spectrum of baryons, uh, agrees with only two parameters, the bag constant and the strange quark mass. Uh, Treating the up and down what about quarks electromagnetic as splittings? Uh, electromagnetic splittings can be calculated uh, in the bag model with the same, uh, with the same, what shall I say, 30% accuracy. So you don't see any calculations that are disturbing. It's just that it's difficult for the model to give you predictions that you can show are incorrect. That's correct. The model can't be, can't, cannot be implemented at a level where we can make exact enough predictions to tell whether the QCD vacuum is well described as a dual Meissner effect. Okay, very good, thank you. Any other comments? Yeah, top of the hill. So does the MIT back model allow blue balls? Uh, it absolutely allows glue balls, and it predicts uh, the masses of glue balls in the 1.5 GV and above region um, where searches go on. Okay, yeah, thank you. Well, this is a rather obvious question. You've probably done it, but I've not been following this. You can solve this with a fixed bag, but it doesn't match. Can't you then perturb around the bag surface? You, that must have been the first thing you did to introduce some perturbation of the shape. Right, so in fact, so the question is, can't you perturb around a uh, fixed bag surface? So first of all, I should say in the original paper, we solved the two-dimensional model exactly. It's isomorphic to the Virasoro algebra. So you can show that the system is consistent dynamically in two dimensions. Unfortunately, we don't live in two dimensions. Um, in the, in the early days of the bag model, Tom DeGrand and I wrote papers about uh, orbitally excited baryons to show that the spectrum of baryons included, to be technical, the 71 minus of Dallas's first excited multiplet of baryons. And uh, you find a spectrum like that, it, it, the, the, those are, you find those states, you find splittings among those states that are uh, suggestive but not accurate, and therefore the, per the, the idea of using a perturbation expansion is not necessarily well justified, and we gave up on it. Anything more? If not, let's uh, bring this meeting to a close. Thank you very much for all the speakers and for the organizers. It was very interesting.